We will read together now, first of all, from the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 39. It's just one question and answer there. Lord's Day 39 and the Fifth Commandment. And then we'll turn after that to the Belgic Confession, Article 36, dealing with the civil government. Lord's Day 39, this is page 555. That's page 555 in the Book of Praise. We'll read that together. Lord's Day 39, question and answer 104. What does God require in the Fifth Commandment? That I show all honor, love, and faithfulness to my father and mother and to all those in authority over me, submit myself with due obedience to their good instruction and discipline, and also have patience with their weaknesses and shortcomings, since it is God's will to govern us by their hand. So far from the Heidelberg Catechism, we'll turn now to the Belgic Confession, Article 36. This is on page 515 in the Book of Praise. The civil government. We believe that because of the depravity of mankind, our gracious God has ordained kings, princes, and civil officers he wants the world to be governed by laws and statutes in order that the lawlessness of men be restrained and that everything be conducted among them in good order. For that purpose, he has placed the sword in the hand of the government to punish wrongdoers and to protect those who do what is good. Romans 13, verse 4. Their task of restraining and sustaining is not limited to the public order, but includes the protection of the church and its ministry in order that the kingdom of Christ may come, the word of the gospel may be preached everywhere, and God may be honored and served by everyone as he requires in his word. Moreover, everyone, no matter of what quality, condition, or rank, ought to be subject to the civil officers, pay taxes, hold them in honor and respect, and obey them in all things which do not disagree with the word of God. We ought to pray for them, that God may direct them in all their ways, and that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. For that reason, we condemn the Anabaptists and other rebellious people, and in general, all those who reject the authorities and civil officers, subvert justice, introduce a communion of goods, and overturn the decency that God has established among men. So far now from the Belgic Confession. After the proclamation of the gospel, we will sing in response to the preaching of God's word, hymn 41, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Hymn 41, 1, 2, and 3, after the sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here are some phrases that might be familiar to us or, or resonate with us, bringing back some memories from our childhoods. Things like, wait till your father comes home. Or, you do this or, or else. Or, while you're living under my roof, you will do such and such. Maybe a number of us remember hearing things like that as children. Maybe some of you children and, and adolescents have heard things like that recently. These are just a couple of snapshots of interactions between one person and then someone who has authority over that person. We all know and recognize that in our lives there are many layers of authority that we have to deal with 
on a daily basis. Sometimes we are the ones who are in authority, and sometimes we are the ones who are under someone else's authority. The idea of authority is present, it seems, in every corner of our lives. We are under someone's authority at all times according to the design of life that God, our Heavenly Father, has put in place. There are parents and children. There are children and their babysitters. There are teachers and students. There are employers and employees. There are adults, you know, citizens, and their government officials. There are adults, church members, and the elders of the church. Authority, authority is everywhere. And it seems that the idea of authority has, especially in the last years, the the last decades perhaps, it has become quite distasteful to our Western, especially individualistic senses. After all, we're, we're... told all the time, every human being is autonomous. Every person is ultimately responsible for their own destiny. Every person is responsible for their own safety, their own well-being. And nobody, nobody has any right to tell anyone else what to do, what to believe, or how to live. Authority is something that if we're able to, we want to sort of hold it off at arm's length. This is, this is Western culture. But as we see from God's word, God has given us the gift of earthly authorities in our lives. God has designed the role of earthly authority, and this afternoon we'll see what that role is. He has instituted it for our blessing, for our well-being and protection. And therefore, he also gives us the command regarding it. We are commanded by God to honor the authorities that he has put in place. This is pleasing to God. And we should strive to do this in a way that is indeed pleasing to him. And so this afternoon, we'll begin first by seeing what God commands regarding civil authorities, and then what he commands about the authorities that are within the family and the church. So first of all, civil authorities. We read an exposition of this in the Belgian Confession, Article 36. This this point, or this division of, of authority, This was certainly one that captured our attention in the recent years, and we all understand why. We needed to understand the principles behind all of this. We needed to know what God's Word was teaching about the relationship that we have with the civil government. What are the boundaries of that authority? What do we do if we think the government is wrong about something, or if the government is calling us to do something that that we believe is contrary to the Word of God? We needed to answer questions like, does the civil government have authority over aspects of church life? And if so, which aspects? Now, it, it may be that we have all had our fill (coughs) excuse me, it may be that we have had our fill of the finer points of this discussion. At any rate, this isn't what we're doing this afternoon. Rather, we want to hear, first of all, from God's Word, what the role of civil authority is, so that, in the first place, we can give thanks for this. So that we can give thanks for this gift that God has given, that he has instituted, and then understand how to seek to live honorably toward the civil authorities according to God's good command. So I want to read, first of all, I want to read together. We we haven't read this yet. We read from Psalm 78, but I also want to read together from Romans chapter 13, which was referred to in the Belgic Confession, 
Romans chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. And we're going to see what principle, underlying principle, is in place here. Romans 13, beginning at verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Romans 13, 1 through 7. What is the very first principle that we encounter here in this? What is the basis for our relationship with the civil government? Well, it's immediately there in verse 1. We have to be subject to the civil authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God and those that exist. So whatever authorities we recognize and, and we see in this world around us, those that exist have been instituted by God. God is the only absolute authority that exists in all the universe. He is the only absolute. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's. It, it doesn't belong to anyone else. The earth is the Lord's and everyone and everything in it. And now we look around and we look at this world and we see that there are authorities in place, all different kinds, and we recognize, we are instructed that this is from God. This is God's invention. This isn't something that people said, hey, I, I know how to make things work. Let's, let's put some authorities. But no, this is, this is God's invention. God has put in place kings and queens, prime ministers and presidents, police officers and judges. God himself put them there, and we need to understand how to honor them as God's servants. So first of all, why? Has God put them there? What's the purpose of civil authorities? Well, Romans 13, verses 3 and 4. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? In other words, do, do you want to be unafraid and do you, do you want to have nothing to worry about as respects the government? Well then, do what is good and you will receive his approval and here's the, the underlying principle here. For he is God's servant for your good. The civil authorities are instruments of God. They are God's ministers. They are God's servants for the good of the citizens. As we read in Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 39, we have a certain posture toward them for a certain reason. We must show honor, love, faithfulness to parents and to all others in authority over us, including the civil government. Why? Since because it is God's will to govern us by their hand. According to God's design, civil authorities exist for our blessing. They exist for our well-being and our protection. They are there to carry out tasks that are a benefit 
for, for human beings, for citizens. In the Belgian Confession, top of the top right of page 515, so uh, top right column, we read there, this is what we confess, God wants the world to be governed by laws and statutes in order that the lawlessness of men be restrained and that everything be conducted among them in good order. For that purpose, he has placed the sword in the hand of the government to punish wrongdoers and to protect those who do what is good. Romans 13, verse 4. They are there as God's instruments, as if they were God's hand itself, to prevent wickedness on the earth and to punish those who commit crimes, those who do wrong, those who carry out wickedness, to punish them and, and dissuade and prevent them from doing so. They are there as God's instruments to, to cause righteousness and justice to prevail in life, this is a good thing. This is a good thing that we should pray for and desire to be in our lives, that righteousness and justice prevails in the society in which we live. It pleases God when wickedness is suppressed and when goodness is upheld. And this isn't just for the benefit of individuals, as, again, we see in Belgian Confession, about midway down the right column. Their task of restraining and sustaining, it's not limited to the public order, but includes the protection of the church. The protection of the church and its ministry in order that the kingdom of Christ may come, the word of the gospel may be preached, and God may be honored and served by everyone. So the ultimate good that the government must protect and promote is that human beings are able to flourish according to God's design. The, the ultimate good that the government must protect at all costs is that human beings are able to worship the Lord and learn how to walk in his ways. The government may not hinder the work of the church. They must protect the church from anyone who would want to interfere with the work of the gospel. There are laws in place that make it illegal to, for example, have a protest, a, a demonstration in front of a church building while a worship service is being conducted. This is a good thing. This is in accordance with the word of God. This is in accordance with what we confess here in, Lord, in uh, the Belgian Confession Article 36. What a beautiful gift God has given us that we can expect to be protected in this way, in this land that we live in. So now we ought to ask, well, what then is our duty? What then is our duty? Well, we must honor this authority that God has put in place over us for our benefit. So how do we do that? Well, number one, we must pray for them. We must pray for those whom God has placed in positions of authority, our civil officers. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, that's also quoted in Article 36. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving, thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, this is pleasing to God. We ought to pray for our prime minister, the members of his administration, his cabinet, pray for our representatives in the legislative branches, arms of the government, not only our federal representatives, but our local elected representatives. And we ought to inform them that we pray for them. They ought to be assured that we honor them according to the word of God. 
And really, it would be good for us to regularly and diligently do this. Let them know by, by letter. Send them a note that this past Sunday in our congregation, we prayed for you. And we prayed that God would bless you and instruct you in His ways. So number one, we pray for them. Number two, we do not dishonor them. We do not dishonor them. It is quite fashionable to badmouth politicians, isn't it? I mean, just drive for a while and count the bumper stickers that you see. I don't have to say any more than that, I don't think. On the one hand, it's permissible to detest the policies of a magistrate, and it's lawful and, and even desirable, it's permissible to try to have one lawfully replaced by another one that perhaps will, will more faithfully carry out the duties of his office and calling. But remember that they have been put in their offices by God. And that that authority exists as one that God has put in place. And let us give that due honor and respect. And speak well, not because of the person, but because of the office. So number one, pray for them. Number two, do not dishonor them. And one of the ways that we do honor them and not dishonor them is by holding them to account, helping them in their work, helping them in their task. We have the blessing of organizations like, like ARPA, for example, that can help us to be informed. Citizens, responsible citizens, help us to interact honorably with the government. And we ought to make use of this. We ought to support that work. We ought to Vote responsibly to try to elect those who will carry out the tasks that God has given to them. Remove those who are unfaithful and replace them lawfully with those who will be faithful to the, the goodness of God's commands. We ought to do what we can to resist what is ungodly in this world, but do it with, with respect. And in the middle of all of this, in the middle of all of this, we must not forget what is most important. We must always look ahead to the perfect kingdom that is promised, the perfect kingdom that is coming. There will always be injustice perpetrated on the face of this earth in every land, in every nation, in every corner of this world. There will always be something to grieve as regards political, civil authority. And so we all the more long for the time of perfection when all things in heaven and on earth are completely put under the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the great name that he has obtained for himself through his work. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. There is no king, there is no prime minister, there is no president, there is no ruler anywhere that is not subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee in heaven and on earth will bow to him. And this is such a blessing for us to have confidence that this will indeed take place. Psalm 2 all of the authorities of the earth are commanded to honor the Son. Now kiss the Son. All will honor and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We long for that time. It has not come yet, but it is coming, and we rejoice in that. We'll now consider the second aspect of this, and that is parental and ecclesiastical authority. God has given us the command, the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. And of course, we understand every other authority to be included in that. This command is given specifically with 
the promise, the first command that is given with the promise. It is given with the promise of, of wellness in, in life, wellness in the land. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. What does that mean? What does that mean? I remember as a kid wondering about that and being confused by that, certainly what it sounds like is if you honor your parents, you will live for a very long time. Does this mean that whoever honors their parents will live to be at least 90 or 100 years old? Of course not. That's not what it means. So what does it mean then? What does it mean then? Well, we read from Psalm 78. And I'm going to read again just a very small couple of, of verses, a small section here. Psalm 78, at the very beginning... Starting at verse 5, he, that's God, established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, so know the statutes, know the ways of God, the children yet unborn, that they would arise and tell them to their children And here's the great purpose of this. So that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. We read that whole psalm, and it was meant to make quite a strong impression (laughs) because that's quite a horrible record that is included in, in this psalm. It's a horrible record of unfaithfulness. God did these wonderful things, and then the next generation, or even in that same generation, they forgot how wonderful the deeds of God were, and they rebelled against him and failed to trust him and believe him, and then God broke out against them and and punished them for that. And they bore the horrible consequences for their unfaithfulness. And over and over and over and over and over, it keeps happening. And so we have at the very beginning of this psalm the pattern that we are to have in front of us, which is, let that not happen. Instead... Teach your children the ways of God. Teach your children the ways of God. Make sure that your children know the Lord so that all of this, these pages of judgment, so that all of that does not happen to them. Let each Generation, teach the next generation the glorious deeds of God so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments and they will enjoy life with God. The promise contained in that commandment, children, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you, the promise contained in the commandment is honor your parents for the sake of life itself. The gift and protection and, and, and blessing of life is shown in the picture of life in the promised land, the picture of wellness, blessing, prosperity in the land of Canaan, their inheritance. How does that work? Well, it's, it's quite simple. If parents were faithful, teaching, instructing their children, well then, children would fear the Lord. Children would know God and trust Him and keep His commands. And then they would enjoy prosperity, good life in the promised land with God. They would enjoy all of the things that God had promised, all of the blessings for obedience and faithfulness that God included in, in Leviticus 26, in Deuteronomy 28, I'll make your enemies flee from you. I will cause rain to fall in season, and your crops will come in, and your, your families will be fruitful, and I will live with you and, and be with you. If parents teach their children to know and fear the Lord, then they will enjoy life in the land of Canaan. However, on the other hand, 
if parents are not teaching their children, and if children are not obeying godly instruction from parents, well, then the result is natural. The result is faithlessness and the rejection of God, and God would not Bless them in the land. What would happen instead? All of the covenant curses that God listed would come upon them. Curses like famine. Enemies will come and, and, and put you under subjection. And finally, if you do not repent and do not repent and do not repent, then finally exile. You are actually removed from the land. You do not get to live with God anymore. That's this promise, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. On the other hand, failure to keep this command means you are removed. You do not live in, in, in blessing with your God anymore. So the command that we children must honor our parents that goes hand in hand with the command and expectation that parents are teaching children to honor the Lord their God for the sake of life, for the sake of your eternal life. Children, honor your parents. Parents, do you love your children? Do you love your children? Of course you do. How much do you love your children? How much do you desire your children's salvation? How much do you desire your children's eternal life with God? Of course you desire this. Of course this is important. How much do you desire that your children would know God and live with Him in eternal life, long life in the blessed inheritance that God has promised, the land that He is giving us. The inheritance that awaits those who are beloved by God, how much do you desire that for your children? So then this is urgent, isn't it? Teach your children. Instruct them to the greatest degree possible. This is not somewhere where we cut any corners. Do you promise as father and mother to instruct your child, your children, and to have him or her instructed therein to the utmost of your power? Yes. Children, honor your parents who are instructing you in the ways of God for the sake of your eternal life. This is what is at stake. This is why God gave you parents. So that you would come to know the one true God, serve Him alone, and enjoy Him all your life. God has given your parents the enormous responsibility of instructing you in the knowledge of God for the purpose that you would know Him and have faith in Him and follow Him all the days of your life. So honor your parents. Their job is to show you who God is so that you love Him and live with Him. What a, what a beautiful gift. Thank God for your parents. And it's in this same category that we ought to include the responsibility of the elders of the church. It's a different sphere of authority. It overlaps in certain respects, but the purpose is the same. See to it that those in your charge are instructed in the ways of God. Elders, ensure that the gospel is preached. Ensure that parents are doing their duty, instructing their children. Be diligent to encourage the people of God to grow in faith 
And then on the other hand, congregation, how do you receive the elders and deacons of the church? Receive them and, and hold them with all honor. Receive them for who they are as ambassadors of Christ. Of Christ. When an elder calls and requests a home visit, they're not requesting a, a personal chat. That's not what they're doing. They are intending to visit as a representative of Christ himself. What a beautiful thing that is. Honor them that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor them for the sake of eternal life. What responsibility there is in this command, isn't there? We could all take a moment or few and think of the ways that we've certainly cut corners in the past weeks and months and years. How much more could we you know, discipline in, in the most positive way, right? Or disciple our children in things like daily devotions. How much more could we teach them about the importance of spending time in God's Word, learning God? How much more diligent could we be in teaching them how to pray, how to come before God and lay themselves before Him? Teaching them the importance of, of, of this, of worship, coming before the Lord in corporate worship, bringing them to worship services diligently, helping them cultivate the good godly habit of worship, make it as, as natural and as necessary as breathing oxygen. That's how important this is. Assembling with God's people in worship is necessary for eternal life. This is where God sends forth his blessing of life everlasting. Psalm 133. He doesn't do it apart from this. We all fail at this. We all do. But we repent of this. We ask God for forgiveness for all of our failings. We ask forgiveness from our children as well, asking them to forgive us for our weaknesses and shortcomings because we, we don't parent them perfectly. God will certainly forgive those who confess these things to him come to him with a broken heart over these things. Now it would, going forward then, it would be discouraging and heartbreaking to make our way through life in, in a world such as ours, thinking that, yes, all authority is corrupt and, and we are the victims of of wrongful authority and, and we can't get out from under it and we're at its mercy, but we can give thanks to God who has taught us in his word that our Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven and that he sits at the right hand of God and that from there he rules over all things with all authority in heaven and on earth. He is a perfect king. He is the only perfect king who has ever ruled this world, and he rules with perfect justice and righteousness. In the course of putting all things under his feet, he has given us rulers, magistrates, prime ministers, parents, elders, ministers, all of whom carry out their work imperfectly and in ways that are stained by sin. But he is able to use all of this for the furtherance of his kingdom, and he is in the process of establishing his perfect rule over all creation. It is coming. So let's give thanks for that. Let's give thanks. And consider this idea of authority to be a wonderful and blessed thing that is a gift of God. Let's worship the Lord by honoring the authorities that he has established under his throne and trust, let's trust, that he rules over all with perfect wisdom and power. We look forward to and we long for the day when the kingdom of heaven is finally fully established, when no evil, no corruption 
No greed for power will exist. We look forward to laying hold of this thing that he has promised. Long life, eternal life, in the inheritance that is prepared for us. So let the Spirit of Christ rule your hearts so that we do honor, thankfully, the fathers and, and mothers in our lives and every authority that God would govern us with. They are instruments for our blessing until we finally reach our heavenly and perfect home. Amen.